Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today we're going to talk about basic conga technique. So we're going to talk about the drums, the sizes, the kind of skins to use on them, whether to mount them or sit, and most importantly, the technique to use if you play a lot of different percussion instruments. So I started playing congas when I was uh, in high school. So I would have been about 15 years old, and we had a set of congas in our band room, and I started messing around with them, and my band director said, what the hell are you doing? I was playing them wrong. And so at that point, you know, we didn't have YouTube or basically any internet or anything like that. Basically no computers. So uh, I would go out to clubs in New York and uh, New Jersey and try to watch players, see every Latin band I could. And I learned an awful lot that way. And the most important thing I learned was that all the conga players I saw played completely different. Uh, I saw lots of players from Puerto Rico players from the Dominican Republic, players from Haiti, and most importantly, players from Cuba, of which there were many, many in New York. So um, I was lucky enough to see Mario Baza's big band on several occasions, and also, you know, I'd see Tito Puente and Eddie Palmieri and uh, Los Von Von on tour one time, and Bata Combali, which was a great band uh, out of Puerto Rico, and uh, Giovanni Hildago was very young, playing congas with him, so I was very fortunate. Also took a couple lessons with uh, Frankie Malabe, who's a great conga player. Uh, he taught at a school called Boys Harbor in the Bronx in New York. Um, so anyway, anyway, I didn't study congas extensively, but I started gigging once I got into college. Uh, there were lots of um, salsa gigs around New York, and they would start you know, very late at night or early in the morning, depending on how you look at it. So. Normally I'd do maybe a jazz gig and then I'd start um, a Latin gig at, you know, midnight or one o'clock in the morning and we'd go, uh, you know, 4 a.m. or whatever. So I played an awful lot and I actually managed to pay my rent between doing some jazz gigs and, and, um, and Latin gigs. So uh, this was over a span of many years and uh, I developed, you know, uh, skills for playing timbales, bongos, congas, wiro, all those, all those instruments. So today here we have several different kinds of congas. It's important that you know the differences between them, not necessarily the brands, but the sizes and, really important, the skins you should use on them. So we'll go from um, left to right, my left. This is um, my original set of congas. This is an original Goombops congas from the late 70s uh, into the 80s. And these were my subway drums. In other words, I would pack them up in my army duffel bags and uh, bring them to gigs. One over each shoulder, they're extremely light and uh, they took a beating and they're, they're still functional. They got some cracks in them. Uh, I don't know if you could see if I hold it up, but you see there's tape around there. There's a big crack there. So they, they uh, you know, I got my money out of them. And these are mahogany, so they're very quiet drums, but we would always mic them uh, for the gigs, and uh, you know, obviously, it made a huge difference doing that. Um, and this is basic cowhide, pretty thick, but these dr these drums were very dry sounding. So, now that's uh, sometimes a good thing. Dry. Um, you'll notice that these drums, which are LP classics, everybody knows about these. Uh, these are great drums, really tough, not too expensive. I like to put them on a rolling stand, so when I'm playing a gig, I can actually push them out of the way very quickly. Unlike these stands, which are, like I showed you before, are just individual stands. They're mounted individually. So the rolling stand is a very good thing to have. And one thing that I do may be different than most people because I do play a lot of drum set and orchestral percussion, so I have to protect my hands. Uh, when I was doing these Latin gigs, I would play, you know, three, four hours a night and then try to play like xylophone and uh, glockenspiel excerpts. And boy, that's really tricky, really hard. So I kind of developed a different way of playing the congas. Um, a lot of the guys that I met and uh, talked to, the, the conga players, you know, who were very well established in New York, you know, you shook hands with them, it was like shaking hands with a brick. Basically, their calluses were so thick. And a lot of those guys weren't doing anything else but playing congas. And... You definitely heard that in their playing. So in order to really uh, be able to play every night on this instrument, you've got to harden your hands. And really, the only way to do that is to play every day for a long time. 
Now, you've got to be careful, especially in the winter when, your hand, when it's dry out, your hands might be dry. They could split. So one thing that I did, I would carry around a tube of uh, crazy glue or uh, super glue, um, they call it, with, with me, and I would uh, close up the cuts with that. And then later on, I'd tape my hands with, um, with tape, Band-Aids, whatever it took. It's just hard to bend them that way. So I learned pretty quick that, you know, it can really affect everything else I was doing uh, at the time. So the technique I developed for playing was more of an open-handed technique. So you'll see when I play that I'm a little bit more open-handed than most conga players would be close-handed. But I found playing close-handed like that put more, um, basically, pressure on my thumb right there and on my fingers. When I played open hand, I was able to play a little more loose and not as much into the drum. And I still feel, feel like I got a pretty good sound, never got any complaints from anybody, and I still play all the time. Um, so that's something you might want to experiment with so your hands don't get beat up too bad, if, especially if you're playing other percussion instruments or other instruments, period. So uh, I'll give you a few tricks to use uh, to get a bigger sound. Uh, one of them is use different heads. So this particular head I have on the quinto drum, the small drum, is uh, a new skin. Uh, Remo, uh, you know, I don't endorse any of these. Uh, I just, you know, if I like them, I buy them. Uh, different companies, Evans has a head like it. I know different companies have conga heads. They're artificial, they're plastic, mylar. Like, uh, like plastic drum heads. Now, the thing about these is that they, um, they're much thinner than regular cowhide. And of course, cowhide, you never know how thin it is until you buy the head, and that's it. It's not like they're all going to be the same they're, because it's coming from, uh, from an animal. So uh, they can make these heads very consistent, the plastic heads, and they're on the thinner side, so you can get a much uh, higher slap, more consistent slap, out of that drum and not actually work so hard. As opposed to these drums, which are uh, timba, basically gunbop's drums, uh, from the um, early 2000s. And these are beautiful drums, but the heads here are steer heads. So they're a little thinner than the cowhide. And I'm sure you can hear the sound difference. These are basically much warmer. Uh, they're great for a gig when you're mic'd up. They're, these are my favorite congas, uh, these particular uh, congas, when I'm playing in the studio recording or when I'm mic'd up. Now, when I'm playing with the orchestra or something, I really, or a show, a Broadway show, or something where I'm not necessarily, um, you know, I might be mic'd in the house, but I don't have monitors other than maybe some headphones that I can hear. I like to use these uh, especially on the Kinto, the small drum, I like to use these uh, artificial plastic heads. Now on my Kunga, which is the second highest drum, uh, we'll go over the sizes in, in a minute, but uh, I use a, a thinner uh, cowskin head or steer, which is expensive and hard to get. So the, the cowhide is, is, is very easy to get, and if you can get them on the thinner side, that's a good uh, head for the Kunga. Now for the tumba, which is the third largest drum, I use an actual heavier head. So you might want to look at it as the drums get bigger, I use thicker heads. Now that's because they got they have more low end, and you, you want that. So, but you'd still want them to be dry. You want the congas to sound dry, not ring forever. So this drum, this is a um, Giovanni Hildago model um, oak drum. It's almost dead. That's coming across uh, with the video camera, but it gives me a really nice bass tone. So again, a thicker head if you can get them. Okay. Now sometimes you're strapped into what the kungas come with. You can uh, always, you know change heads, and I would suggest you do that, maybe, or experiment, um, if you can. 
All right, so once again, we have the steer heads that you can get those. Um, they'll be the driest and the thinnest, so in other words, easier to play. Then you have the cowhide, which is a thicker head, but also dry, but won't speak as quickly, but will have more of a low end, as you hear, compared to, all right? And again, I hope that's coming across on the microphones. Now this particular drum, this is what I call my Nino, my little drum. Uh, this is the Gunbops. Uh, these congas were very small. They, they, I think they used to make them a little smaller. Um, not sure about that, but I think so. Uh, now you've got to kind of special order a drum this small. So this drum's about nine and a quarter inches, uh, whereas this Kinto here, which is considered the basic small drum, the, the slap drum that you use, uh, would be about 10 to 11 inches. And then we have um, the Kunga, which is the second drum, which roughly will be about 11 to 12 and a half. You know, it all varies, but we're not talking about more than an inch difference in size. And then the Tumba, which is uh, basically 12 to 13 inches. You can get a super Tumba, and I have one of those. It's like huge. It's 14 inches. Uh, it doesn't have a whole bunch of use in, unless you're playing a lot of melodic. You know, that kind of stuff where you're going for different different kinds of tones. And of course, so many great conga players, Richie Flores, and of course, Giovanni uh, used this to incredible effect, playing actual tunes. Uh, if you listen to an early Bata Kumbale record, you'll hear him play Oh Susanna <laughs> on, on, I guess, five or six congas, you know, which is incredible. So uh, th then you need a lot of drums. But basically, you just need the, the two drums uh, to play most gigs, which is the quinto, the small drum, the slap drum, and the conga. All right, and then if you want to add another one, add the third drum, which is the tumba, which is the larger one. And then if you want to add another drum, you can add a nino, which is small, which is a super slap drum, which you can slap. And those are super useful for slapping with your left hand when you're doing. So you can slap without muffling. So let's talk about the strokes, okay? A lot of people have trouble with this. Of course, you'll go to the park and you'll see the drum circles and people playing. You know, they don't really have any idea what they're doing. It's all fine and good, but it's not respecting, I, I consider this, respecting the heritage of the instrument, which is incredible. So we need to learn the right strokes, or at least the basic strokes, to function on the instrument properly. I have different names for these than, than some folks, and there's not really that much of a standard right now for conga notation and names and you'll hear different things from all kinds of people so the most important thing is that you know what the strokes are supposed to sound like not necessarily what they look like on paper or what people call them okay the most important stroke uh, is going to be these two strokes so heel toe I consider that obviously uh, two strokes but some people feel that that's one stroke or one motion which is that back and forth motion. Now for this, you do want to start out by holding your hands closer together, okay? So whether you want to uh, tuck your thumb in or not, that's up to you, okay? But I leave mine out because I feel like, like it gives me more leverage to get a bigger sound. So the, very important to practice this just like that get used to it. It's not a, um, a normal body kind of thing that your body would do naturally. So, Okay, and you want to be able to get uh, as big a sound as you can. Now, all the grooves live here. In other words, when you play, that heel-toe technique is your filler. So if I just went You know, we don't have anything to fill in that. It's like ghost strokes on a drum set if you're playing funk or whatever. All that little stuff you're playing your snare drum and your hi-hat, that fills in the beat. That's what makes it groove. So that heel toe is important. So the first stroke we're going to show you is this heel toe slap. Now, when you do the slap, the toe should, or the hand here, 
call this the toe when it's with the fingers, should be flat on the drum so it's dry. Of course, this is to start out with. Later on, you can do these strokes with one hand, you know, cup it like that. That's harder to do. It's like a rim shot. But here, the hand is flat on the drum, and we're doing our slap. Now, it's important that when you do your slap, you don't push your hand into the drum. If you do that, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to bruise your, your bone here. You're going you're to get probably tendonitis in your wrist. You've got to stay loose, okay, especially if you're playing other instruments. So what you do is you drop your hand. Like that. Now this part of your hand, and this is the way I try to explain it to my students, hits the drum first, so let's say the lower palm, and then a split second later, your fingers are hitting kind of in the middle of the drum. Hear that? So if I don't do that with the muffle, it sounds like this. That's called an open slap, okay? So that's another stroke. Kind of almost like a djembe kind of motion where you're... All right? But the close slap, you're leaving the hand on there. The left hand, that is. The right hand's coming up just a, just a hair. It's not sticking on there like this. Okay? That's, again, that's later. That's a slap by itself different sound but this the fingers are coming off now you know you're doing it right when you feel a little bit of tingling in these fingers especially these three if your pinky reaches that you'll feel it there too but these three you'll feel a little buzzing okay uh, I managed to do slaps like this lots and lots and I don't have any issues with my hands doing it this way okay but if you're driving it in like that then you're gonna have some problems you're gonna especially with your elbow you'll get what's called tennis elbow you get tendonitis there and it's a whole mess so you don't want to you don't want to deal with that all right so again the main stroke I call this a stroke or exercise that you're going to use is this you to start practicing this a lot so that's heel toe slap 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 okay now the next step you would do heel toe slap toe heel toe slap 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 okay slow I'll show you heel toe slap toe heel toe slap now these are the building blocks for uh, uh, Rhythms, and I'm sure you've heard like the mambo, the soon, all, all these rhythms, the cha-cha, just different tempos. So the soon. So that's a groove that you put together using that heel toe slap. Now the only thing we haven't gone over uh, yet that you heard in that groove was the open sound, which is this. And that's the easiest stroke because all you're doing is you're hitting the drum with the fleshy part of your of your palm. You want to go for as warm a sound as possible. It should be pretty. Okay? So you don't have to hit hard again, just, just like that. So when we do this, we call it uh, syllable-wise, heel, toe, slap, toe, heel, toe, open, open, heel, toe, slap, toe, heel, toe, open, open, heel, toe, slap. Now as we go fast, our motions become a little bit lower. We go slower as in a cha cha cha. So 
So then we can use a bigger motion. That helps with the timing of it, all right? Uh, one stroke you saw there, maybe you caught, was a palm stroke. That's a dead stroke. That's used a lot in a rhythm called Wawanko. It's a kind of rumba. So um, basically you use these dead strokes and also bass strokes. So. the melodic so um, and that's common you know in that style of Cuban Cuban drumming so uh, I think I covered everything pretty much as far as tuning actually I forgot that uh, normally I tune the drums in in minor thirds maybe I'm not that um, meticulous about uh, the actual perfect interval being there So normally the interval between these two drums will be a lot more than the interval between these two drums. So the quinto and the conga, the interval, you know, thirds, maybe a fourth. Here, you can go as far as a sixth, okay? Minor six or below. It can be quite a bit. All right, if you're using five drums, then we're talking about seconds. Actually, one more thing before we go, uh, something you might want to start practicing. And by the way, all of these rhythms and many more are in my book, um, Advanced Coordination for Drum Set and Hand Percussions, the one with the octopus on the front. I have a whole section on conga rhythms and all everything's in there from, you know, there's lots and lots of Cuban rhythms, even some Brazilian rhythms that you can play. Although congas aren't necessarily indigenous to Brazil, they sure use them there a lot. So, you know, play samba. That's, you know, that's a book that all these are in if you're interested. Now, one more thing I like students uh, who are beginning on congas to practice right off. And I um, almost forgot to talk about this, but we're going to right now. So I like to do a lot of independence exercises on congas. Uh, I think that it helps with your sound, it helps with your time, and obviously it helps with the different strokes. So one thing I like to do is these little ostinatos. Uh, it could be between two drums or one drum. So this is, would be like a two-drum ostinato. And then you're playing that like this. You can do between these two drums or on one drum if you don't have three drums. Or, and then what you can do is play on, you know, um, so what that is, that's the actual um, uh, bomber rhythm, which is. It's one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, or one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, four. And there's lots and lots of permutations of that. You can do, you know, close, close, open, close, close, open, or switch between them. drum so right away that's a really good exercise to start working on and it's it's pretty simple you can just do that one two three four one two three four you know and then do your little exercises with your left hand and even if it's something really simple uh, you know you can start trying it a uh, great thing to do is do that ostinato then play just a, a page of rhythms with your left hand. And 
whatever they may be, you know, you can improvise around that. So that's another technique that I like to, um, to start students out with. So we'll play a little and then we'll call it a day. I will post some more advanced conga videos uh, in the future soon. So thanks for watching.